Go on, Ann. Go on, Ann, over top. You still got it, look. Go on, Ann. Still got it. Oh, wouldn't like that one on the door, right. he broke your back. Yeah. <laughs> My job at Christie TV was going all well, and then I met Andy Hill, and this is part of the we've got to go today. We've got to go today. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Kushti TV, the straight talking YouTube channel. And what have I got here today in surprise for you is the former WBC international champion and the three times British light middleweight champion. Yes, that means he holds his Lonsdale belt outright to keep forever. Yes, he was a brilliant hard man boxer, but he was an hard man amongst hard men. And I had the privilege here in West London to be invited to his home. Yes, all my honour and all yours to watch. Ladies and gentlemen, it is... Andy, Stone Face Till. Andy, welcome to the show, brother. Hello, Joe. How are you been, mate? All right, my old no mate. See. Long time no see. How yeah. is things? Yeah, not bad. Been better, been worse. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you're looking well. A bit heavier than your fight weight, but you're looking good. Slightly heavier. Slightly, yeah. About yeah. 10 stone. <laughs> so, we've got a little bit of noise interruption going ahead. We're near one of the airports in London, but we're all right now. I think you can hear us at home there. Right, tell us, Andy. So clearly introduce you as an old man, that you are, that you were, um, you were gentle, and you are, giant. that you were and you are, <laughs> tell me, how did it start, how was your early life, tell us a bit about your early life and how you become a fighter. The only reason I became a fighter was because I, had, my brother went down North Park Boxing Club, Yeah. and he kept coming back with wet hair, and I said to him, how come you got wet hair, he said, because we got showers down the boxing gym, Right. and we weren't allowed a bath. When we were kids, you only had one bar a week on a Saturday, so we were ready for church on Sunday morning. Right. So I started going down to the gym just so I could have a cold shower three times a week. Right. <laughs> That's an interesting way and, to start. And uh, I enjoyed the training and that, and I was all right at fighting. What was your earliest memories of fight? Was that was that um, before boxing? It must have been on a playground or something, was it somewhere? Yeah, it was when I was in the. Uh, Last year the junior school. Yeah. And uh, this uh coloured guy and he thought he was hard. Right. And he had a go he had a go with one day, so I hit him around the head with my plastic bag, but I had my uh steel toe cap rugby boots in it and hit him in the head and knocked him out. Oh dear. <laughs> so so you, 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 you achieved knockout by foul initially. That, sure that was your yeah, that, that was your particular time, time, yeah. Did you move on to secondary school this bloke? No, he went to another school. Right, I bet he was thinking, thank God, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, you're one of how many? Uh, oh, brother, six sisters. brothers, two sisters. Yeah. So I'm, big, the, I'm the youngest of nine. The youngest of nine, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're a big family then, yeah? Yeah. Of course, yeah. And um, your brothers are decent fighters? My brother, Ray, Peter and John. Yeah, they can all have a tear up. They could all have it. Yeah. So so you then join the boxing club. Which age you join the boxing club to get this shower? Eleven. Eleven. So your first fight, you, uh, presumably you got fit and got like a what you call My a first medical fight was card. Twelve year old. Twelve, yeah, 12, twelve year, year old. old. Yeah. And you started off with. Um, did you excel straight away? Did it take time before no, you become a bit? No, you start bit? off like in uh, six two minute rounds. Uh, three three two minute rounds. Yeah. And you, you, um, you were not noted in the nicest way as the most skillful fighter, but your skills and your aggression still took you to the national ABA final, didn't it? I mean, strength for me and the aggression and determination took me to where I got. And you were ABA finalist, weren't you? Three times. Yeah, and, and for you, for you guys back at home, the ABAs are done a more of a technical way than professional boxing. Is that fair to say? That's so it. to reach the final was still a hell of an achievement. Yeah, but the national got, finals. They like to be a technical boxer. Where I weren't a technical boxer, that, I was more of a fighter than a boxer. And that weren't really you. And yeah. My strength and determination got me through all my fights. Yeah. Because they didn't have enough heart and strength as I had. And you, were, how many amateur fights approximately? I had, exactly, I had exactly 122 amateur fights and won 98 of them. So you so won 98 out of 122. Just yeah. say a few decisions went against you because you wouldn't, wouldn't have been the favourite style, style of the amateur boxing that's, association that's exactly and the correct. England selectors, etc. But the, and you, I think you went the distance nearly when I've done some research. Nearly every fight you hardly ever got stopped before. I the never, never ever got stopped. You never got stopped. Only by cut eyes. Cut eye, yeah. So cut technical. technical never got. Stops. Never got. Counting it out or anything like that. No, yeah, yeah. So, so typical, um, all the all marks of an hard man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, then um, you, you went a long way in the amateur ranks, 122 fights. You were experienced, and then suddenly, what makes you decide to turn pro? 
Oh, I don't know really. I thought I'll just have a go and see how I get on. Yeah, you, did you harbour any ambitions to become a champion as a pro from a little boy or anything? Yes, I did actually. That's the age. When I was little, I thought I want to become British champion yeah. and win the Longsdale belt. Yeah. And I achieved that, and I think once I achieved that and won me, like, give me ambition, I lost a bit of heart, I lost a bit of interest. Well, you, you, re you reach your goal. Yeah, I and reached my goal of winning the Longsdale belt outright. So, so, so you reach, so reach your goal. So let's. Let's talk the journey up towards then the lines about. So you've had this ambition as a little boy, which eventually you fulfilled. So we turn pro, and then you go through the earlier stages over, uh, presumably you started that four threes, then six threes, eight threes, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And you're winning nearly all your fights so earlier. Was, and when I first turned pro, it was six twos. You do there six was, twos there was no in there. Four now. twos or four threes. Yeah. It started off with six, six twos, two minute rounds. Then six threes, then eight twos, then eight threes. Yeah. Then ten threes. Yeah, let's say, let's say for you boxing fans at home, there was such a thing as a lot of two minute round fights back in the day. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of that. And it sort but of changed no a bit post. Round, they started off with they really six, twos. six two minute six rounds. Six two minute rounds as opposed to now your first fight could be four threes. Yeah, so four it's, it's three, a similar yeah. difference, but better tear up six twos. Yeah, yeah longer uh, fights. Yeah, yeah, you got to be fit. Yeah. So, so you're winning nearly all your fights. And then um, your first stepping stone, you get off of the Southern Area title eliminator. Yeah. And you win that. You got, a, you got a title shot for Southern Area title. Yeah, knocked him out in eight rounds. Knocked him out in eight rounds. How was it going prior to the knockout? Close, tough fight, or were you ahead, do you think? No, I was ahead. Yeah. It was me aggression. Yeah, yeah. So um, so you wore him down. And one thing you did have in your artillery was aggression, was art, um, was bravery, but you also very good natural stamina. But what people didn't know about that Southern Area title fight Leading up to that was the first fight I ever done road running for. Was it? And I never and because I started road running, I was doing it in obnail boots like they do yeah. in the army. Yeah. And I was running on concrete instead of running on grass. Yeah. And my feet started hurting. Yeah. And I was a milkman at the time as well. And then after the Southern Area Championship fight, Tony Britton. Tony Britton, yeah. That's who I boxed. Yeah. After the Southern Area title fight, three days later, I'd done the London Brighton bike ride. Right. And at the time I was married, and my missus got knocked off her bike and broke her kneecap in half, so I went to the hospital with her. Right. When I was at the hospital, I said to them, any chance of looking at my feet, I said, because they've been killing me for three months. Right. I come out with plaster in both feet. I had eight to ten stress fractures in both feet. So really? My feet were particularly, like, broke. I, I thought we'd broken feet. Fought with broken feet. Now, where's the message at home to you youngsters? One thing... Determination one, kept me going. Kept him going. And one thing we have learned, uh, what we thought was good, we a lot of it was good back in the day, but it's not necessarily. We now go with nice, cushy trainers and maybe put some lead weights around your feet. But obnail boots and concrete, I mean, I got shin splints back they in the day. Match, don't that's what I got yeah, now. Yes, yeah, there you go. So, yeah. so, so um, for you youngsters at home, um, some cushy, nice pair of trainers, even oh, if you can't and afford them, the and run on the grass or a track or something, absolutely. Yeah. So, you, you become the Southern Area champion. Yeah. Um, um, and then, then becomes what comes of that? You get shortlisted for a, a, a title for a fight, British for title a British fight, title. Yeah. But before that, you you had a crack at the WBC International against a Welshman, John Davis, or was it? John Davis from Wales. John yeah. Davis, yeah. And um, how and did I that won, fight go? I won it. Was that a points went decision? Yeah, it went yeah. distance. I won it on points. Yeah, just because he was a tough man, John Davis. He wasn't was. He, he yeah. moved up from uh, welterweight to light middle because all he was knocking all the welterweights out. Yeah. And I was the lightest, I was the uh, lightest of light middles at the time. Yeah. And he'd moved up, so virtually his weight was like virtually yeah, the same. same. But I beat him on point. So you now got two bouts for your collection at this stage, because you're a Southern Area champion, which you were still old. Yeah. Now and WBC. Now you're WBC national international. Champion. Now you, you're a milkman. Now tell me, an average milk round, milkman got to get up and do their paperwork. Yeah. and all the bits you go with it, which they have to, obviously, do, do their figures and make sure it's all right, your till roll, etc, etc. But um, they would take a, a, an average bloke about five hours to do his milk round and, and would equate to his seven or eight hour day. Is it true you used to finish your milk round in about an hour and a half by leaping over the gardens? About, about two and a half, three hours ago, I used to run most of my milk round over the garden fences, not in and out of the pathways. What, what do I want to waste time going up and down pathways? Well, when I jump over the fence. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and finish early. Yeah. And and uh, you were known as Andy Stoneface Till, but I think it was a local grands and housewife nicknamed you the Mental Milkman from Norfolk. Fighting, when you mil start fighting Milkman from Norfolk. Yeah. yeah. And and was the Mental Milkman also mentioned sometimes? A bloke that kept leaping the fences and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we had some nicknames. I think you, I mean, if I see somebody Andy jumping over my fence 100 miles an hour delivering milk, I think the Mental Milkman wouldn't be far away from the real name, would it? But I, it's early in the morning. No one sees you. Oh right, must have been a few up. Though you get yeah, the name. Yeah, must be a few up. Yeah, it's got. To I think all your mates realise how come is till back in the depot at ten o'clock and we're back at one o'clock or whatever yeah, it was. So I used yeah. to run my milk yeah, run. Yeah, milk run. But that must, have, joking aside, that must have kept you really, really fit on top of your training. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, I'm going to touch on that later. When you when you lose your title, I'm going to touch on that bit later. How you changed jobs and it could have had some no, effect. No, that is before I lost my title. I changed be jobs. Yeah, but but as you as you changed, yeah, didn't, didn't change. you change jobs as you were yeah. still champion? Yes, yeah, while I was still champion. And, and, and you, 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 you always it, felt that impacted so the impact your the milk round went franchise. Yeah, and my round was no good because I had shit payers. So it's all on tokens. Like a lot of uh, council owned yeah. like council estates all had the uh, milk tokens and that. So you was collecting no money. Yeah, and that don't count as cash. It right. counts as cash, but only to the milk debt, but not to me. Yeah. So my my round weren't no good to be a franchise milkman. Right, yeah, yeah. So, but you did think that in in fact, but we'll come on that. We, we, your job change actually maybe softened you a little bit in the nicest way. You had a much tougher. Made physical, me lazy. Made me lazy, but there's a way. Made me lazy. Yeah, Too much sitting around waiting for in between jobs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's, where you're sitting in a canteen and there's a uh, vending machine with milkshakes and chocolate bars in and that, and you're sitting there doing fuck all. Yeah. Oh, I'll have something to eat, and then I was eating like yeah, yeah. And then, then the weights are struggle, ain't quite and the same. weights are struggle to get on and off. So you're Southern Area Champion, WBC International Champion, and you had this, you once, you once, I read this from a, 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 another journalist, you once said somewhere, uh, they said, how do you spar with heavyweights, cruiserweights, of all this, and you said, I don't give any respect when I'm fighting, and I don't want any respect, and that That's was about right. your attitude, yeah? You yeah. don't want any, and you ain't going to give any when you're in there, because it's That's a dangerous it. place. That's it. And you weren't frightened to take on big heavyweights, I know, in the sparring sessions, including Joe Bugner Jr., Scott Welsh, Barry Ellis, you got an injury with Barry Ellis, didn't you? I think Barry sparring. Ellis, yeah, yeah, yeah. But before all that happened, I'd um, boxed a super middleweight, Steve the Viking Foster. He's a world title challenger. From Manchester. Fight after me went on a world title, world title fight. fight. But my fight after him was Ensley Bingham. Yeah. And that was a British title eliminator. Yeah. But Ensley Bingham was in the corner when I boxed Steve Foster. Yeah. And Steve Foster was like, was he had 12 fights, knocked nine of them out. I stopped him in five rounds. And Ensley Bingham, my next opponent, was in his corner. So when it came round for me to fight in Bingham, Bingham knew the strength for me. Yeah. First round come out, Bosch nuts me, cuts me over the eye. Second round come out, nuts me, cut me over the other eye. So of a 12 round fight, I've cut over two eyes. Third round come out, boom, boom, right hand, double right hand up my ball bag. And the ref ain't said a word. So I pull his head down, smash him in the back of the neck with my elbow. You can't yeah. say what I said, but. Yeah, <laughs> not on camera, right? I was yeah. disqualified. Okay. And that was my. And fight. you were ahead on points on that fight? Against Bingham? Yeah. You would have won that as well, I would, have, I would have stopped him in the next two or three rounds, but he knew that. That's why he nutted me and done what he done. I, I think he knew he was up against the very hard punching Steve Foster, puts you flat on your back, and you got up off the floor. Twice in one round. You got off the floor yeah. to battery him about three or four rounds later, didn't you? Correct, yes. Yeah. And both of them guys, for you viewers at home, just to give you an insight how good Andy Steve Chill was. Steve Foster was a super middleweight at the time, not a light middleweight, not a middleweight, he was a super, super middleweight. middleweight. And he went on to, both of these fighters challenged for world titles, yeah. respectively. Yeah. yeah. So three of your opponents challenged for world titles. Yeah. Um, two of which you almost beat, and one you lost to points, Rob McCracken. But we come to that. So so now now you're seven area champion, WBC international champion. We've got the chance now of a British title. And that's right. I got disqualified in the final in the final the eliminator for the British title. And then Andy Bingham went on to fight Wally Swift, and yeah. Wally Swift knocked him out in six or seven rounds. Right. So Wally Swift knocks out Bingham. Andy Bingham. Who has beaten you on disqualification? Yeah. And you now get an opportunity to fight Wally Swift. Yeah. Which is it would be my second fight to fight Wally Swift because I fought him in '86 at the uh, York Hall Bethnal Green. Yeah. 
and it was the only time in 30 years that Nobbins money had been thrown yeah. into the ring and uh, Emmanuel Stewart was at ringside with who was he anyway? Uh, Lennox Lewis? No, older than him, long before him. Anyway, Emmanuel Stewart was at the ringside. Yeah. Emmanuel Stewart said in the paper the next day, the fight I seen between Wally Swift and Andy Till was the best fight I've seen in five years. Yeah, uh, well, uh, and he had the likes of uh, I was told. Marvin Agler, yeah, uh, Sugar Ray, yeah, uh, all of those boys doing it in that era, yeah. What's the tall fella name? Tommy Ernst. Tommy Ernst. Yeah. And he said that's the best fight he's seen in five years. Well, somebody reported if it if it had been a ten round to be fight of the year, it's got to be ten rounds and above. If they said if it had been a ten round, it was an eight round, they would have no doubt been fight of the year with a British border yeah. control. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so you've had a cracking fight, which you got the nod on that. It was a very close fight. Yeah, you got the boys. nod, and now you're f challenging him. Um, for, for a man, the soul, yeah. yeah for so just to set the record straight, Bingham beat you by his qualification. He loses in six rounds to Swift, and now your opportunity comes to um, fight, Swift fight Swift for the second time for the second for time for the British title. And again, and an umdinger. Yeah, an umdinger. He went twelve rounds, but leading up to this fight with uh, Wally Swift, I was sparring with Barry Ellis, the heavyweight who you just mentioned. Yeah. And he threw a right hand, and I put my elbow up, and he punched me in the elbow, and my elbow come up like a balloon. Yeah. And that was eight weeks before the fight. Three weeks before the fight, uh, James Cook, who is the European champion at the time, and British champion, hit me a right uppercut under my nose and took my nose clean off my face. Really? Uh, 14 stitches. That sounds painful, doesn't it? For you, you people at home, you imagine that? What, the nose was just... Just, just come just off. come off for the come face? Off. Just had a hole in your face. I went up to the hospital, had 14 stitches put in it, and come back and carry on sparring. <laughs> that was three weeks before the second, for my first British title fight. fight. So you, 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 you fight Wally Swift. It was voted fight of the year. It was a cracking fight. Yeah. It was a close fight. But again, um, you got the nod. Yeah. So, so, so Swift um, has had two cracking fights. Because yeah. I think um, you, yeah. you once stated in, in an article of all the men you'd thought, he was a gamest and toughest. He was remember. the hardest man I'd ever fought, Wally Swift. And if you weren't with me, he'd still be champion today. But let me just point out... Even though he's 60 now. Before... <laughs> just a joke, but, but at, that's how good he was. At the end of that fight, I was going to go to the hospital the next day, had my arm looked at, but my manager had already made the fight up for five weeks later against Tony Collins. Yep. So I still hadn't had time to have my arm Tony attacked. Collins, travelling fighter from uh, Berkshire Way, Crowfarm, I think. Cam um, Yateley. Yateley, yeah, Yateley, yeah, from Yateley, yeah. And uh, he was Frank Warren's golden boy. And he said he was going to knock me out in six rounds. Yeah. And five weeks before the fight, he phoned me up at the house, at my home. He met some people up uh, Ealing Boulevard and he said, bring him down here, we have a lot of cobbles. I said to him, let's do it sensible, let's get the fight on in the ring and we fight, fight with both purse while he's in the changing room afterwards. And he agreed on that. So you wanted to have a fight in the changing rooms as After well? After fight, yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, he said he's going to knock me out in six rounds, I knocked him out in three. But I yeah. still had my bad arm. Yeah. I went to the hospital the next morning after that fight, my arm was broken in two places. Was it? So I'd had two. Championship Which fight. part of your arm? Elbow? The elbow. The yeah. elbow. I see the elbow scar there, yeah. Broke in two places. Yeah. Which no one knew about other than me. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> anyway, I went over to him, asked him if we still wanted on the cobbles, and uh, by all means he said no, which I didn't think was a surprise that he was going to say no. No, I'll because be he, the uh, Tony Collins, oh, I knew his brother, I knew, I knew all them boys back in the day, and they were tough boys and they were good fighters. But to, to think, um, to beat him in three rounds, he was highly rated. And yeah. I, I think now, uh, for your viewers at home, and we're going to hit to a point in a minute, Andy was, uh, when he peaked, because I did know your career, when you peaked, um, newspapers report, one said that you were the hardest, strongest, like middleweight in the world. Another report said they offered Nigel Ben a quarter of a million, who were two weights above you, a quarter of a million pounds, a lot of money then, to face Andy Till in a non-title fight. Ben's camp reported, or Ben reported, I only have... Nothing to gain by beating Andy Till, only to lose. So that, that's, yeah. um, you know, yeah. this, this is how good um, Andy was, and he peaked. And um, 
he didn't end there because he got a third fight now coming up with Wally Swift. So a, a really, really seasoned tough fighter. His his father was a British champion. They were great. He, apparently, his dad fought ten rounds and won a fight with a broken jaw. They were really, really tough fighters. Now you've got the third fight expected to be a really another war, another war with Wally. What happens in fight three? Well, that was four weeks after I had my arm operated on yeah. after beating Tony Collins, yeah. and that was at Albert Hall in London. And it's the third time I. Box Wally Swift, who was a great fighter. Don't take that away from him, full respect to the man. But my arm was good, my nose was good, and I knocked him out in four rounds. There we go, so we've got one of the hardest fighters in the UK without any doubt, Wally Swift. Two great fights with Andy, one being fighter of the year, the other one would have been fighter of the year. But I think it underlines where we're coming to here at when Andy peaked. He peaked and he got right on, he's right on song here. But soon, as soon as this happens, that job changed and the divorce happened. Yeah. And it took a bit yeah. of shine off of things. Well, in the nicest way, it's an hungry, tough game. And you have now won your Lonsdale belt as a little boy you dreamed of. Yeah. What I wanted to do, I won the Lonsdale belt outright. So I've lost a bit of me ambition sort of thing. You, 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 and you really semi job, relaxed because yeah, you got what you dreamed of. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time as that, talking about. My manager had tried to make a, uh, a world title fight with John Julian Jackson and yeah. John David Jackson in America. Yeah. And they both wanted, knowing full well my manager never had the money and I never had no sponsors, they wanted half a million for me to fight them in America and in 1991. Fortune to that money. Fortune, just and like having six million. million half a million back then in 1991 is like. 10 million a day. Yes, and that is stupid amount of money. That's yeah. the sort of money they're getting today, all these yeah. world champions, which I'd like, if I could get myself back a bit fitter, I'd go and fight these world champions today. <laughs> you still got a bit in you then? Yeah. You still, still you work. still do a little bit on the bag and that now and yeah. again? Yeah, yeah good. I do, yeah, and the pads. Good. good, well maybe you'll show us a bit of that later. Good maybe. boy, well, I'm, I'm pleased with that. Now, so, so you get a, a, a title shot, a European title shot instead of the world, which many believe, I, I believe when you peaked you would have won it, we had a job change of divorce, as you rightly said, a little bit of hunger yeah, had gone. I had divorce indoors and my head weren't right, I was, I was messed up in the head. And a, a fella called Lawrence Bouani, I think his La name was. Lauren Bouani. Lauren Bouani, yeah, yeah, Frenchman, great fighter, a very good fighter. He'd become a world champion for a lot of years, I believe, didn't he? Yeah, well, he had 21 fights with 20 knockouts, all within six rounds. I knew that I could get put down and get back, get up and come stronger which as I've the seen fight you goes do. on. Which against I've Foster. against Foster. And there was another one, who else put me down? I don't know, another fella put me down, but I got up and beat him. Well, well, that was your style, your character, yeah. yeah. I just made me more determined. Anyway, Lauren Wood Wiley. Put you down in the fifth, put was it? Put me down in the second round. Second round, I was got it? got up, and I went right up, I cut left to right cross, and he's hanging on me for dear life, and the ref breaks us apart and tells me to stop holding. Yeah. So whose side do you think the ref was on? Well, there you go, yeah. It says something, yeah. And you had a nasty, nasty cut that needed plastic surgery, I think. No, that was in the fourth round. Fourth round later on, yeah? Well, uh, I'm getting stronger as the fight's coming on. Now, I thought, well, he, he ain't been past six rounds in the last 20 fights. So I'm getting stronger and stronger. I've hit him a double left and a right hand on the ropes. He's come off the ropes, and as he's come off the ropes, he's used it as a catapult, and he put his right side of his forehead in my right eye and opened me up 32 stitches. And the ref looked at me and said, box on. So I went the rest of the round thing, uh, keeping covered up and that, but still marching on, attacking him. At the end of the fight, I went over to the court, Harry, stop the fight, I'm fucked. And then you hear me say that on the DVD. Yeah. And not only that, like I said, I was going for a divorce, which messed me head, which messed me head up. Two minutes before I go out of the fight, who comes into the change room to see me? the fucking woman I'm married to who we ain't getting on with. Right. And he messed me up even more. Yeah. You know what I mean? There you go. Well people but, don't know these No, of course not, but it's nice to explain to the camera. So so you, you, you are you are an odd man, but you take the knocks in bruises. Sometimes you hit, sometimes you get it. Um, tonight wasn't your night. That you then defended your title to But the then I tell you something I was about that Lauren Boudwani. He went on to fight four weeks later and he got knocked out in, in, in two or three rounds and he got put in a coma for a week. Yeah. But what I can't understand, as long as I've got an hole in my ass, is that a year later, he won a world title. Yeah. I'll now, after being put in a coma for a week, how on earth, 
any boxing ball in the world will allow them to carry on boxing and to get a world title. And they did in them days, they were tough sure days. It's all to do with yeah. finance, But politics, they remain world champions. Boxing and politics. Yeah. Which, which is good to, good to the to the credit of yourself. Yeah, because he, um, he worked there. Yeah, he didn't beat me fair and square, you know what I mean? No, but you, you lost a world champion anyway, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is always nice to know, if anything else, eh? So, um, yeah, so so that night wasn't to be your night. You're now, um, you've settled down, you've had a rest, you've got your plastic surgery, but you've still got your Lonsdale belt, and yeah. they can't take that from you, but you're still also the British champion. You defend against a very highly rated, a lot of you guys will know him at home. Rob McCracken from Birmingham is now a top trainer. Trainer of uh, Andy Joshua. Yeah, Andy Joshua's yeah. trainer. So you fought McCracken in a close 10 round, uh, 12 round fight at uh, Watford, was it? Yeah, and uh, McCracken used every dirty trick there was in the book and got away with them. And as soon as I'd done a little dirty trick, I got pulled to send to the ring and got it was made publicly that I'd done something wrong. Because I'll tell you what was and, telling that night. Robert McCracken's manager, Mickey Duff, was set yeah. ringside and he was promoting the fight. Like I say, it's all to do with politics. politics. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what else, Andy, politics. you probably wouldn't have had too much time to look at it. But I'll tell you what was telling. Andy was more the local fighter, he's North London, he's West London, it's up the road at Watford, yeah. And he's, he's a Birmingham boy, so so Andy's on home turf, more like, yeah, we're, we're in London. There's but about three and a half thousand Birmingham City football and, support. And they were Birmingham City, and they didn't only break the town centre up, they broke every pub and they started breaking the venue up. Yeah. So when the referee sided with, in fact, the MC went on, I don't know because I was at this fight, the, the fight, MC the says... Fight, the fight got stopped three times during the fight, and the crowd were told if the violence weren't going to stop, both fighters get disqualified. There'd be a non-contest, that's right. Yeah, that's be right. A non anyway, I remember it. Anyway. So it gives you some idea, and I sat with then Frank Maloney, who is now Kelly Maloney, in some strange yeah. way, well, however that's yes. worked, but yeah. it has. Um, that's the way it's done. Um, and Frank Maloney said he would never ever promote um, uh, Rob McCracken, McCracken ever. Yeah, yeah. And it stopped Rob McCracken from getting his world title fight. He it took about to another move, four yeah, years. to white, uh, 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 America to fight. So he didn't do him yeah, any favours. He's fights in America, and I don't know this. How he got all in America, but then he came back to be a trainer. I saw Robert McCracken at the uh, first Aldi Harrison fight at Wembley. Yeah. And he shouts over to me, All right, Andy. I said, Not really, Rob. He said, Why is that? I said, You never won that fight, mate. He said, Well, my fault. So in, in his head, he knew he never won the fight. But like any fighter, if you're going to have your hand risen to be champion, you're going to take it in you. Oh, absolutely. No, really. Well, you get away you with some and some you don't. What I do remember is a tough, hard fight. Yeah. So this um, tough, grueling title fight, a bad cut against Buwani, a long, hard career, because you fought, you fought with your, you, you didn't fight on style, you fought on aggression, a long, tough, hard career. You decide to retire yeah. from boxing. Yeah. Um, like many people, you do tempt to come back. Yeah, eight, eight months after retirement, I'm, I thought I'd make a comeback. I wanted to come back and make a fight at middleweight. Yeah. And I got down to super middleweight, and yeah. silly enough, I let Harry Holland talk me into a fight to fight at super middleweight, which I had no problem with. But in this time of me retiring and coming back, there have been two cases of uh, two boxers being knocked out and put in coma. One was a uh, It wouldn't have been the Michael Watson Yeah, Michael then, Watson, Michael what Watson it, what it got put in a coma, then Gerald McClellan. Yeah. Yeah, in this time I'd come back. Yeah. So the referees were very quick to stop a fight. Yeah. I was boxing this fella called Darren Griffiths. He was a super middleweight. I was, I was weighing super middleweight, but I was naturally a light middleweight before. Yeah. But I wanted to fight a middle. And Harry said, You're, I'm, I was going to stop this fella in by round four or five. And he caught me in the right hand in the second or third round. And I went down, got up with a counter two. Yeah, I'm all right. Ref held my hands up, put my hands up. He counted me out. Stop boxing. I said, What are you, I said, what are you want to make your cut? I said, I've been up since round number two. And he yeah. counted me out. I said, that's it, the last time I ever stepped foot in the ring. Well, it's a long, tough road. Nobody stays at the top forever. So you, you've got your boy, your dream, like as achieving the Lonsdale yeah. belt. You know, lovely fights on Sky, fight of the year, all those awards. And yeah. um, you've got your good looks to Still tell, which, look. which is, which is good. good woman. And you've got a lovely lady. Yeah. So all things are good. Um, now tell me, 
I was at a boxing show one night and there was a commentator called Mike Goodall, he's an MC and he's still around I think Mike, um, he's still with us certainly and he still does a bit of MC work, they were doing an auction and there was about seven or eight different champions, boxing champions, you were one of them and he shouts out, right make sure and pay for that painting or that picture whatever it was he says, I'll send Andy Till over to you. So he mentioned you amongst hard men amongst hard men. So you had this reputation of being a hard, all boxers are hard, but you had a, a reputation of being yeah. a hard boxer amongst hard boxers. Yeah. So tell us, um, tell us a bit about an altercation. I've been, done a bit of research, because you're at home, I've got to do a bit of research, of course, otherwise I've come here not knowing anything. You had a little bit of a rough and tumble with some blokes in a snooker club one night. Yeah, I was out playing suit with my mate Graham Stevens, who's a professional golfer. Yeah. We were out there playing snooker, hall with about 20 tables in, only one of them was being used, so we went up the end, set up, and these four geezers started chatting about and that. I asked them, can you keep the noise down, gentlemen? It's a snooker hall, not a fairground, you know what I mean? Right. I asked them politely, I went out of the toilet, come back, one of them said, said, do you want it? I said, yeah, I want what? And I'll give the right hand of my own. I said, no, you're oh, going to give you it, it first. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, I've done him. He's on the floor. And then another one jumped on me. So I've done it. I've put both thumbs in his eyes and right up to him as far as I could go. And then the first one I knocked, he jumped on me as well. And Graham was standing there with a snooker cue, swinging it, trying to keep the third one and fourth one away from me. Right. Oh, son. Snooker ball started hitting me on the head. Right. And I'm like nutting them away. <laughs> I looked up at the fella, I said, when I get, let, get that go this one, I said, I'm going to fucking poke your eyes out and all you cunt. Right. Anyway, I never come with it anyway, I ended up getting up. I said, listen, I said, this ain't fair. I said, four on the one. Yeah. Four on the one. Yeah. Yeah. Four on the one. Yeah. 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 I fought you all four of you at one time, I'll still come out of the winner, I said. Yeah. They weren't out, they all run off. Yeah, so, yeah, so <laughs> they didn't fancy four-handed. Yeah. And apparently these blokes weren't no mugs, they, would, they, they could have it, I was told, these blokes. Well, they was older than not older, but like... Faces, yeah, yeah. boys around town, yeah. Tell me, you, you, you once got stabbed in a road rage, how did that go? How did you finish second or first in that fight when you got stabbed? What happened? I finished first. And how did that go? What happened? I was on my way to work over the airport. Going along the A's bypass, and a car in front of me overtook me, and he jammed his brakes on in front of me, and going at silly speed, 10 miles an hour, and then he shot off. And I caught up with him in the lights, so I got out of my car, just went over, I said, Why are you driving like a prick, mate? And with that, he leant over and pulled a screwdriver out from underneath his suit jacket. I thought, I don't need this. So I went back to my car, closed his door. He's come walking towards me with a bit of other like that. So I've got to get out of my car. He put the screwdriver straight through my arm, yeah. knocked my arm off the door, then he done me in the back with it, so I got over the top of the car with my right hand, knocked him out. Yeah. Phoned the old Bill. I said, I've just been stabbed twice in a road rage. I said, if you, I said, uh, I said, I've knocked him out. I said, hang on, I said, he's just getting up, hang on, wait there. <coughs> knocked him out again. I said, yeah. I've just knocked him out again. I said, but if he gets up again, I'm going to make sure he stays down there. <laughs> <laughs> he stabbed me twice and there was no need for that. I'm on my way to work over the airport. <laughs> then when we come, the old Bill come, the ambulance come. We go to the hospital and he's sitting where you are, over there, in the same chamber with me. Somebody, as far as I'm concerned, tried to kill me. Yeah. Like stack, put a screwdriver, that could have been in my neck or in of my course, eye. yeah, yeah. I phoned the old Bill up and said, the bloke I've been arrested for for assault He's been, he's sitting three foot away from me, who stabbed me twice. I said, he's up here on his own with me. He said, are you using your mobile phone in hospital? He said, because if you are, he said, I'll have you nicked for, for improper use of your phone. I said, you're having a fucking arm, yeah. Yeah. Cut him off. Did you cheat him again? No, because, uh... Doctors were around. Yeah. <laughs> so I you end up getting nicked and you got stabbed? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, but, isn't it? But end up going to court. Yeah. And because... They listened to his fucking lies. Foreign country, was foreign, foreign a chauffeur. It's about yeah. six foot four, about twenty stone. Oh, big and, old I was, man. and I was only about twelve, thirteen at the time. Yeah. And they said to me, uh, "We understand you're pro ex-professional boxer." I said, "That's correct. That's why he only sustained your injuries he did. Because I was in control of what I was doing. Otherwise, I would have kicked the fuck out of his head." <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> so we were lucky anyway. But that good. So so I think this is giving you an idea where um this fearsome reputation come from. Now tell us a little bit, um you, you had a reputation back in the day, um and you still have. Um you you hired for a bit of enforcement work here and there. I've done a little bit of going to the talks to people who they owed money to, people they People ask me, this person owes me money, we're going to have a chat with them. I've never done anything violent towards anyone, I just, just spoke to them nicely. And the way I spoke to them, encouraged them to pay up their debt. And that was enough, and you weren't involved in naughty stuff like no. drug debts or anything, no. just genuine debts, yeah? Yeah, I wouldn't do anything to do yeah, with anything. Any of that, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, well that's fair enough, so just um, Andy Till's presence got the job done. That's correct. Well there you go, not a, not, not a bad man to be around in that field. So, <laughs> So tell us, Andy, um, you were the British professional champion. Um, we've just touched on what you're capable of doing out the ring. You were one of Britain's hardest men. Um, I'm sure in the day you believe you was the hardest, didn't you? At my in... light, at light middle weight, I was the hardest man in the world in the boxing ring. There was nobody else to stop me, other than financial situations. Yeah. So t tell us, um, you could mix it in the ring. Unlicensed fighters like Lenny McLean, Roy Shaw, so many people are, are, are aware of them and they always ask questions. How'd you done with Roy and Lenny outside in the cobbles? I don't know how I'd have done, but I'll give it me all. Put it that way. Yeah, yeah. If I come out, I'm a determined person. I will not stop until I've won. So, what does that mean? You think I you don't have, give in. You think you would have won then or lost? I don't, can't say, can you? No. It ain't never, ain't never gonna happen because they're both dead, are they now? Both gone now, bless them, yeah? Yeah. No, it can't, but it's interesting. Oh, Roy Shaw's still alive, isn't he? No, Roy's gone as well, bless him. But, um, yeah, but that's interesting to know. And how did you think you marked amongst London's hardest men? Do you think you're up there? I don't think I'm an old man at all. I just live my life as I am. I'm a nice, gentle person until I ain't got to be. You still do a bit of would you? What? A bit what? Would you still have a fight if you had to? If I had to, I would, but I don't need to. I'm a nice person. Yeah. <laughs> do you think anybody might take a few years under your belt as a bit of weakness? It, no. has, it has been tried in the past. And they learnt the other way? They've come across the hard way. They've no. learned the hard way. <laughs> there you are. So just, just tell us, um, for fans out there, firstly, before we touch on that, have we got any regrets in your fistic fighting career? None at all. None at all. Would no. you do it all over again if you had the opportunity? Yeah. But okay, and um, what message we got for all the fans out there and young people? Be good and be safe. Well, that ain't too bad, is it? There you go, as promised, one of London's and Britain's hardest men brought to you right here on Cushy TV. Thanks for tuning in. You keep subscribing, I'll keep delivering you. Some interesting characters like Andy Stoneface Till, Andy, former WBC International, three times British light middleweight much. champion. Thanks for joining the Thank show. Tune in next time. Box safe.